Good afternoon, um, everybody. Uh, my name's Nicola Gale. Obviously, I work for Cardiff University. Doctor! Doctor, Doctor, Doctor Nick, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise known as. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you to ten of us for uh, being part, really, of, of the Sing for Life Choir. It's really great when you see something, uh, a piece of research, which really makes a, a difference to patients' lives. And to be part of that, it's almost every researcher's dream. So thank, thanks for that. Um, just to change uh, subjects a little bit, this is a, a study I've been working on since uh, 2011. We received a, an innovation grant to undertake a study which is entitled The Role of Exercise in Patients ca with Cancer Cachexia, a study of outcome, uh, preferences, motivation, and outcomes of importance in patients with cancer. So this is a collaborative study which uh, was led by Dr. Anthony Byrne, who is a consultant of palliative care at Llandoc Hospital and also a member of the Wales Cancer Trials Unit. Um, we, well, we set up the study with uh, Professor Robert Van Dersen at Cardiff University from the School of Healthcare Studies there, um, and also with um, colleagues from Cardiff Metropolitan University, so Dr. Kerry Ann Bax and David Wosley. Um, we are very grateful also to um, a NISCA uh, funding support. Uh, this is a portfolio study. So we've received um, assistance from uh, NISCA-funded nurses to help with the research. So that's a great thing that we've been able to access um, su nurse support across Wales. Um, so the background study, first of all, what does it mean? Cancer cachexia, probably everyone thinks, what, what is that? Um, so to define cachexia, it's actually uh, an involuntary loss of lean muscle mass. Um, so it's a loss of muscles in your body, basically. And not surprisingly, that has quite profound effects on your ability to function. It's particularly prevalent um, in patients with advanced cancer. They, with patients with advanced cancer often have a loss of appetite. They lose weight. They also do less activity, so you lose muscle. And then that has impact on your ability to do things, so phys physically undertake activities, uh, go out and socialize, and with impacts on your emotional well-being. The result is actually reduced quality of life for patients and also for their carers and friends as well. The next slide um, just shows a, a graph, really, of the function of patients in the last three months of their life in palliative care. So on the, uh, on the axis on, on, the, on the left, as you look at it, we've got the Kanofsky performance scale. Now, that's a scale from 100... Uh, down to zero, where 100 is where you're at perfect health and zero is the end of life. Um, we've got days along the bottom, so in time, that's the last three months of life. And we can see that this is typical for patients in palliative care, that as time progresses, there's a gradual decline in function and there's a necessity for increased input from uh, NHS services as well as health as care or supporters. Um, what we're interested in, in seeing seeing if we can um, actually move that graph, move the shape of that graph so patients are maintained uh, sort of at home living independently. So on the, the functional scale, once you get below 80, you're starting to need more support. You're generally independent at home until that point. And sort of once you get into the region of 40s, you need hospital help. So if we can maintain patients at the higher realms, at, at around 80 or just below, Patients can stay at home, which is generally what they want, and they need less input from, from NHS and care support services. So one means of, of maintaining, maintaining patients' function might be to provide exercise. Um, so there are some studies that have shown that exercise can improve uh, quality of life and function in patients undertaking chemotherapy. There have been a few studies which have looked at the effects of exercise in patients with advanced cancer, but these studies have really been small. They've had a lot of dropout. The patients were unable to continue the intervention or the exercise program. So that it's really difficult to, to answer the question is, can exercise improve outcomes in patients with advanced cancer or with weight loss? We really can't answer that yet. Before we even get to that point, we need to really decide what kind of exercise patients would want. So this has led us on to the study, which I will talk about now. Mm -hmm. So before we can actually design an, an exercise intervention, we first need to find out um, how quickly, quickly patients actually decline functionally. What, what would motivate patients who are unwell to actually undertake an exercise intervention? 
what kind of exercise intervention might they want to undertake? And do they currently get any, any uh, advice on what exercise or what activity to, to, to do at the, at the present time? So the aims of the study were primarily to measure the change in muscle strength and balance and function over an eight-week period in patients with um, significant weight loss and cancer cachexia. We secondarily wanted to look at um, some of the patient's preferences and motivation for undertaking an exercise intervention um, and also to explore some of the barriers to, to continuing exercise. So with my colleagues from Cardiff Metropolitan uh, University um, and Cardiff University and Anthony Byrne, we came up with a, a design in two parts. The first part, we aim to recruit 50 patients to uh, look at patients' function and physical uh, ability over an eight-week period. So we aim to recruit 50 people and to see them three times over eight weeks to give us an, an idea of how things would change. The, se for the second part of the study, we wanted to ask patients with uh, significant weight loss to complete questionnaires to tell, the, to tell us about their motivation and preferences for exercise. That would be administered by a research nurse or by a researcher. And all of these assessments, these were designed to be undertaken at a clinic uh, situation, a hospital clinic, or in a home situation, because we wanted to maximize potential for recruitment. We um, were reasonably specific about the patients we wanted to include in the study. We specified patients with lung or gastrointestinal cancer, because we know that these are the types of people who tend to lose weight uh, and that has a poor outcome. Um, so they needed to have a self-reported weight loss of um, at least 5% in the last six months or ha have a low BMI of less than 20 and then any, any other weight loss. We included adults over 18 who, were, um, who, who would be give informed consent and be willing to participate. And they'd have a life, life expectancy of more than eight weeks as we wanted to keep people in for the eight weeks of the, uh, the, the, the physical tests. And also we wanted to ask patients within that time frame of life what their abilities and what their preferences for exercise would be. We excluded patients who had a, a lower life expectancy than eight weeks and those who had any other problems which might affect the results of the physical assessment, so things like a stroke or Parkinson's disease. So this uh, slide just gives you an idea of the physical assessments that we undertook. Uh, so we were looking at muscle strength of the legs. We looked at quads, which, are, which is at the front of the legs, and the hamstrings at the back of the legs. We measured that using uh, a strain gauge. So a patient sat in a chair. We attached a, um, a strap to the front or the back of the leg, and then the patient had to pull or push as hard as they could to get a, a value of how strong and what their maximum force they could achieve was. We also measured hand grip strength, which was done simply with a, a hand grip uh, measure as you hold in your hand and squeeze as hard as you can. And we measured balance using a biodex bias way, so that's the, uh, the middle picture. Um, that is a sort of force platform which enables you to uh, measure how well a patient or the, a patient's uh, ability to stand still, so static balance, how much sway um, they, they were... Uh, they undertook when they were standing still. And we also looked at dynamic balance. So they were given a task with this machine to move the center of gravity to various places. We then got a score for accuracy and a score for time for how quickly they were able to undertake the, um, the balance test. We did a couple of functional measures as well, one called the timed up and go, which is simply the time it takes to stand up from a chair, walk three meters, turn around, and return to the chair. Now, that's an integrated test of strength and balance, so it's quite a good and quick and easy way of measuring things in a cl clinical situation. And we also measured the timed 10 meter walk test as a measure of uh, gait speed or walking speed. So we, we started the study, the, uh, the grant was given to us in May, I think it was 2011, and we started initially um, in Slandock and Belindra to undertake to start patients, recruiting patients for the physical assessment and also for the questionnaire. Um, what we found is that recruitment was a little bit slower than we anticipated. Fewer patients actually met the inclusion criteria. Weren't, there weren't as many patients as we expected with the weight loss. 
So quite quickly, we uh, managed to enrol uh, the Aniram Bevan Trust to help us out with undertaking the questionnaires. They weren't, uh, we weren't able to do the physical assessment there as well. We were also very quickly able to um, gain the support from Betsy Cadwalder University Health Board and also Abitawi Broma Ganog. So we then had uh, five sites across Wales uh, contributing to the questionnaire study. So we have been going quite a long time, a little bit longer than we anticipated, but we are very nearly there. I recruited the last patient for the physical assessment uh, two weeks ago, so hopefully in six weeks that part of the study will be finished. Um, and we're at the last count, and I'm hoping that there will be a few more questionnaires to, uh, to arrive on my desk on Monday next week, but we're up to 178 of the 200, so we're doing very well. And you can see uh, there's, we've had major input from the, the additional sites we, re we recruited for, for helping us, and it, it really just demonstrates the benefits of multi-centre and uh, using sites across Wales. Just a quick look, uh, just a really quick look at some of the, what the, the characteristics of patients who've actually undertaken the physical assessment. Um, so in turn, we looked at uh, the patients with lung cancer who were from Flandoc, and from Belindra we recruited gastrointestinal uh, patients. So we had 25 in each group. They were absolutely identical in terms of males and females, so we had nine uh, females in each group and 16 males. We were a little bit surprised. Um, the bottom pie graph shows BMI. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's essentially your uh, weight divided by your height squared. And the normal healthy range is defined as 20 to 25. Now, in the lung, lung cancer group, the majority of patients were in that healthy range, 20 to 25, compared to the gastrointestinal group where they were in the overweight range, 50% were in the overweight range. We weren't really expecting to find that, but um, that was a bit of a surprise and perhaps why we weren't recruiting as quickly as we anticipated. Um, this graph, I don't know if you, you can see it really, but um, just shows the two different groups, the lung and the gastrointestinal patients, to see if there were any differences between the two groups of patients. Um, the next uh, click just shows that we did some magical stats as ever. Um, so the red circles show that where there were significant differences between these groups of patients. So the timed up and go and the 10 meter walk test were different with patients with lung cancer taking longer to do the timed up and go test and also taking longer to walk 10 meters indicating perhaps worse physical function. Otherwise, they were very similar in terms of their age, um, their weight, uh, and also, uh, I can't see what the other one is, though their hand grip strength. <laughs> Looking at the physical assessments, there were also significant differences in terms of the uh, strength of their quads and hamstrings between the groups, but there was no difference in the balance tests. <clears throat> A quick look, there's 18 patients that have now completed the assessment, so we've had a significant dropout. Uh, we've, this chart shows how uh, the, the measurements that we've taken have changed over time. And oh, just to go back, there's no stars or no, no circles, red circles on this one, so there's no significant change. It appears that these patients are quite stable over an eight-week period. Just a, a quick look at some of the questions we've asked from the, uh, the questionnaire. We asked about preferences for doing undertaking exercise. Uh, and the first question we asked was where patients might like to do, undertake the exercise. And um, we can see that the majority of patients uh, would like to do the activity. Um, I can't see from here either. Oh, my God, gone a bit too far. Um, I think the image, no, let me just do it. You can see the height for each. Basically, the numbers indicate uh, where patients would like to undertake the exercise. So, um, the majority of patients wanted to undertake exercise at home. Um, and the majority of patients actually said that they wanted to undertake exercise alone, so they were willing to do it without friends or partners. The next graph just shows some of the beliefs that patients had about exercise. Um, we asked whether patients, uh, what they thought if it would have an effect on their appetite or their ability to function, etc. So we can see that the highest scores were for um, the uh, ability of exercise to actually maintain daily activities with also significant benefits on their social activities as well. The other interesting question we asked is, had the patients had any advice from any 
for healthcare professionals, with the majority of patients saying that they hadn't had any advice at all. Um, uh, nine patients with lung cancer had been told to do some kind of physical activity, but the majority of patients had none, no advice. So just to conclude, really, the, um, there were, looking at our data, there were physical differences between patients with uh, lung cancer and gastrointestinal cancer. Um, there were a subgroup of patients who um, were stable over an eight-week pe period, and these might be the patients we need to target for an exercise intervention. The, uh, the questionnaire showed that there was an independent, uh, a preference for patients to undertake independent exercise, who so exercise alone, um, at home. And many patients believed that exercise would be beneficial, or even though they had no advice to do any, any, any particular physical activity in, from the healthcare professionals. Um, we also conclude from the study that actually recruiting and retaining patients within uh, interventional and follow-up studies is quite difficult. Um, but we do, it does highlight the benefits of multi-center uh, research, really. The next step is really to finish uh, final recruitment uh, and do a little bit more analysis. We hope to publish maybe three papers from, uh, from the research. We would then like to apply our results, so we want to use the information from this study to design a further e exercise intervention which will be led by the patients. Um, and then we can trial that. We'd like to include a, a control group to see really if exercise can have a beneficial effect. We believe that the network of collaborators who we've included in the, the present study will be beneficial in setting up future studies um, and that the, with further collaboration with the NCRI, the National Cancer Research Institute, palliative rehabilitation subgroup will also help us with subgroup studies. I'd like to thank all the participants of the study and uh, I'm happy to take any questions.